Well, there was an entry-level shepherd who was once working the night shift, and as he was keeping an eye on the sheep, he began to look at the heavens and the moon and the stars, and he began to ask some questions. He saw the magnificence of it all. He said, God, who am I that, that even you are mindful of me? Who am I that you would even care about me? He, he saw the scale of everything, and he saw himself as being small and insignificant. And then, in a moment, God sort of flipped the conversation. And the heavens that he had seen to be so distant, he all of a sudden was able to envision them as a crown of glory and honor. And the earth that God had made that was causing him to just sort of see himself as sm so small in the middle of it all, he realized in a moment that what he was standing upon, that God had made subject to him. I, I think sometimes that we go through life and we look around and we see everything being so much bigger than it is because it's so much bigger than we are and we begin to question, what is my purpose in all of this? What is my significance in all of this? And I think sometimes we miss that that childhood wonder and that childhood vision where we give God an opportunity to take something that seems so magnificent and put it in a picture where we see ourselves accomplishing everything that he has placed us here to accomplish and doing everything that he has called us, in fact, here to do. I think that in times like now, it's not that we really lack the faith to do, but sometimes we just lack the vision. We lack seeing what we can do. We, we have the faith to do it, we just, we just don't know exactly what it is. And so today, if I could just take some time and let us talk about this idea of vision. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 2, and beginning in verse 6, it's going to walk us through the story we just told, and then put it in our context. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. So right here we see that everything has been put in subjection to Jesus. Everything is under the control of Jesus. And that is actually a faith issue. That is something that we either believe or we do not believe it. And when we're talking about faith, let me just sort of emphasize we're not talking about vision. When we're talking about faith, we're talking not about what we see, but rather what we have heard. Because faith is a hearing thing. 
This is why I believe in the importance of preaching. This is why it's not just a religious obligation for you to sit down on a given Sabbath or Wednesday or whenever you would consume the gospel by hearing, but rather when you sit down to hear the gospel, you're putting yourself in a position for faith to increase because preaching is actually the vehicle that God by his sovereignty has chosen to deploy faith into your life. He didn't choose another way for you to receive faith. He didn't choose vision for you to receive faith. He didn't choose study for you to receive faith. We meditate on the word of God so that we do not sin against God. We study the word of God so that we show ourselves to be approved, a soldier who would be ready to work in God's army. But when he said faith, when God talked about faith, he said hearing is the way that you receive faith. So what we do every single Sunday is that opportunity for us to sit down into the presence of God and give him a vehicle to bring faith to us. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 2 uh, was very, very clear in this. This isn't my idea. This is a gospel idea. The apostle Paul said, let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or... By hearing with faith. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 14, he said, How will you believe in him in whom you have not heard? And how will you hear without a preacher? Verse 17, for faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. There's something about listening that's different than studying. There's something about putting our, all of our other senses in pause where we just have ears to hear. And when we put ourselves in that place and we just have ears to hear, we then give opportunity for God to bring us what we need. We give him opportunity. We give opportunity for faith to come, which we need faith to please him. We need faith to walk. All the vision in the world does us no good if we don't have the faith to step towards it. But how do we get faith? By hearing. Let's just walk through the life of Abraham very quickly. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8 says that by faith, Abraham obeyed. When God called him out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. At this moment in the life of Abraham, there was no vision really necessary. God just said, I'm going to take you to a place that I'm building for you. And I just need you to leave where you are and go to it. And Abraham had no idea where he was going. He had no idea where this place was located. He had no idea what it looked like. He wouldn't even know that it was there when he got there because he had no idea where he was going or what he was looking for. He had no idea. He just simply stepped forward because God called him out. And so it said, by faith, Abraham did that. And he walked and he walked and he walked and he walked until he came to this place where God says, look out. Look all around you. Now he showed him, look all around you. This is the land that I was talking about. This is the land that I'm going to give to your offspring. Now, in this part of the conversation, now Abraham has had everything that he so desires. He has seen that God is in subjection. He's in control of everything. And then let's go through a few more years. He was in that place for 10 years. And it came to the moment where God had promised him a decade ago that his offspring would occupy the land. And now Abraham wasn't as concerned about the land because he was living in it. But he hadn't seen an heir. He did not have offspring. And so he sits down with God and he says, um... I I don't have an heir. 
I, I have a really good servant and he's like the only one. And so am I just supposed to give all my stuff to him? I mean, you promised me that I'd have offspring, but I don't see it. This is Abraham, the father of our faith. He says, I don't see it. And then in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 5, God says, come with me. And God took Abraham outside. And he said, look toward heaven and number the stars if you can count them. And then God said to him, so shall your offspring be. God showed him what he was going to do. It wasn't a faith issue in a moment. It was about vision. It was about showing Abraham what he was going to do. At this point, he was 85 years old. It would be another 15 years before Abraham would even see the beginning of that vision manifest. But for 15 years, he kept on walking. For 15 years, he kept on moving by faith. Why? Because he had seen what God would do for him. He had seen the promise. And many of us today, we have consumed the word at high levels. One of the beauties of our generation is that we can consume the gospel at proportions that has been unknown in generations before us. We have consumed, we have studied, we have read, we have heard, and we have heard, and we've heard again and again and again so that we can even tell the same stories. We have faith. We have all the confidence in the world to do whatever God wants us to do. We just have no vision, so we have no idea what that is. And, and vision is one of those things that is, it's sort of a you and God kind of deal. Um, it's, it's really not something that someone can give you. It's not something that someone can convince you of. It's something that you have to spend time in the presence of God until you can see what God would show you. And when Abraham came to that place where he was, he couldn't see it, God then took the moment and he showed him. And that, that's what I love about this text. Because in this text, there is that faith part where it says that everything is in subjection to Jesus. That everything has been put under his control. And then it goes on and it says, but we don't always see that things are in his control. And that's sort of like where we find ourselves in life today, most of us. We just look around and we, we believe that God is in control, but at present, we don't see it. And, and this is where we have to see something that gives us just the vision to move forward. And let's talk about that for just, just a minute too. That, that idea that everything is in subjection, everything is in control, that is a faith issue. It's something that we believe, but it is not something that we always see. And so we can sometimes let the conversation get a little bit out of control or maybe a little bit off step because we just say things that make us feel better, but what we are saying to make us feel better now can actually create some confusion later. So if I look around and I see absolute chaos and I believe that God controls everything, then I might say, well, God has everything under control. The, the confusion in that statement, if what I mean is God is actually controlling everything and God is actually moving everything, then what I'm then saying is God is actually perpetuating a deadly disease, that God is actually destroying families, that God is actually taking loved ones away from other people, that God is, God is doing all of this horrific stuff. God is manipulating environments and economies and he's, he's squashing down people that have little to have less and God is controlling all of this. If I say that God is in control in that context, it creates a great confusion to my faith. But if I understand it, that God has allowed us to live with everything under subjectivity to us, that he, in a moment, can exercise his control, 
but that he has not exercised his control. So at present time, what I'm actually seeing is the world that we have therefore created then if I understand it in that way, then I have a greater desire to pray because when I pray, what I'm actually doing is I'm asking God who has the power to control everything to exercise his authority and bring change where right now there's chaos. If I see the chaos as being controlled or manipulated by God, then I won't seek to pray because why would I pray that God would stop moving? if what I'm seeing is what God is doing. But if I recognize that the chaos can be brought under subjectivity to his power through this, this desire in me, this faith in me, or this prayer from me, then I can believe in my world, in my world, in my household, that even though there is chaos, I can believe God to come in and turn it around. Every parent knows this. Every parent has lived, at least maybe, maybe I'm just the only parent. There are some times that when my kids get out of control, I just watch it happen. Like, they're crying, they're screaming, they're yelling at each other, and I'm just like, what's, what's going to happen? Let's see what happens here. Are they going to use their tools of conflict resolution? Are they going to walk in love? Like, what's going to happen here? I could exercise my control and send everybody to their room and clear out the chaos in a moment. But I'm seeing how they are going to live. Um, when, when my kids were really, really young, really young, we, I am not even gonna say we, I had nothing to do with this. My kid, I had nothing to do with this. This was all their mother. She sent them to this infant swim rescue now, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but it's when you take like really little kids, like babies practically, and you just like drop them in the water. And they supposedly teach them how to swim and save their own lives. I'm sure it's a great idea, but it, it looked terrifying to me. Anyhow, it's a, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. And all of our kids went through this, and every single one of our kids fell in the pool. Um, what I never, ever saw was any of my kids actually exercise the skills that we paid hundreds of dollars for them to exercise to see if it actually worked. I have no idea. I remember one time I was mowing the yard and Walt had a little John Deere battery operated mower. It's not a real mower with a blade. It just looks like a lawn mower. And he felt like he was mowing and I was mowing. And he was going around the pool and he rode his John Deere battery operated lawn mower right into the swimming pool. And I was on the lawnmower and I watched this happen and I just turned the mower off and watched to see what is he going to do? Is he going to flip over, float, go on his back to the side exactly like he had been taught to do? I'll never have any idea because in a moment his mother was in the pool, snatched him up and took him out. I have no idea if all that money spent would have ever worked. And, and this is what I'm saying. In our world, God has given subjectivity, subjection to us to live. And we can either live by faith and therefore produce the glory of God on the earth, or we can live in rebellion and create the chaos. And what I think sometimes we as Christians like to do is to sort of take our responsibility in what's going on and just sort of abdicate it elsewhere and just say God has it under control. Please understand, by faith we know that all things have been put in subjection to Jesus and that Jesus has been given control over all of it. But at any given moment or slice in time, what we can see is at the present, we do not see him controlling it. And sometimes in the middle of when we don't see Jesus controlling things, we have a utter and complete total loss of vision. All we see is the world around us, and we no longer see the world of possibility that he has told us we can have. And so in a moment now, we need to see what we have not yet seen. Because we do have this promise a vision. 
In Acts chapter 2 and verse 16, there was this moment where the Spirit of the Lord was poured out and they heard wind from heaven. It was like a rushing mighty wind. The sound filled the house. But then they saw fire sitting upon every single believer in that room. They heard the wind, but they saw the fire. And they all began to preach and prophesy and speak in tongues. And there were all these people that gathered to see what was going on. And they they misunderstood the whole thing. And so then Peter says this in Acts chapter 2 and verse 16. He says, "You, you don't understand what you're seeing. You've missed the point. Because this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. What I love about this here is Peter didn't say this is what Jesus promised because many of them didn't believe in Jesus. He didn't say this is what the prophet John promised because some of them had gotten confused at who John even was. He took them back to one of their notable prophets that they believed and that they studied. And he said this is what was uttered by the prophet Joel. That in the last days declares God that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters will prophesy and your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. We have the same promise for dreams and visions in the last days that we have of prophecy. We have the same promise that we will not only hear but that we will also see. We have the same promise that it won't just be faith that will be increased in our generation but that it will be vision. So what is it that you see when you look around your household? What is it that you see when you look around your career? Do you see what is at the present? Or do you see through the present into that beautiful future, into that painting that God would paint for you? What do you see? And I think sometimes we see nothing. And that's the problem. And we think that if we just hear more, if we listen more, that we'll suddenly see it. But you don't see with your ears. You see with your eyes. It's different. And what is it that you are actually looking for? Are you looking for a renewed vision in your life? Um, I was one of these kids that was educated in the 80s and the 90s. And so I, uh, I can remember being in really early first, second grade and working on this device called a TRS-80. And it was a Radio Shack computer. And alongside of it was an Apple II. And those computers were both produced in 1977. And they lingered in schools forever. And like the height of our computer programming was, you would, you would say something like, um, go to 10, and then you'd put a few spaces and an asterisk, and then the next line, go to 20, and you'd put like three asterisks, and you'd go on, and at the very bottom, you'd say run, and after 40 minutes of typing in a bunch of symbols, it would just go, and you had a Christmas tree, and, and that was it. That was all that we did in our computer classes because that was basically all that you could do. That was was like it. That was the height of personal computing. And so if we just take some of the titans of that era that were wandering around, you had guys like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs that they just recognized that this isn't going to do it. They had a dream to put a computer in every single person's living room. The problem was, if all you could do with the stupid thing is say, go to 10, run, and you get a Christmas tree, that's never showing up in the living room. And so they realized that there was more. They just didn't exactly know what it was. And one day, Steve Jobs is taking a tour of a think tank over at Xerox, and he sees this thing called a graphical user interface. 
And when he sees these pictures on a screen and a mouse that you could just select something and it would happen, rather than you having to program for it to happen, he knew right then because he had seen it. In a moment, he saw what needed to be produced that would put a computer in the house of every single person. And for those of you that are woke right now, and my little story's a little too old, please let me let you understand that without that revelation, without him seeing that, there'd be no Snapchat, there'd be no apps that you scroll through and stupid games that you waste your days playing. You wouldn't even have an iPhone if there wasn't that day that he saw something that enabled him to have vision for a future. If it wasn't for Thomas Edison's theory of relativity, we wouldn't even have GPS. You wouldn't even be able to put in an address into that phone and push directions and it take you to the right place. So vision sometimes comes in layers. And I think for some of us, what can happen is we feel like if I receive a new vision, if I look for something new, then I'm somehow disrespecting what has been before me. There is no disrespect to the the past by layering vision on top of it. Jesus even said nobody goes out and puts new wine in old wineskins. There comes a point where maybe that blog that you've been reading for 10 years that hasn't inspired you in forever, maybe you need to replace that blog. Maybe some of the influences that, that helped you maybe a decade ago or two decades ago, but that's not helping you anymore. Maybe you need to find yourself in a place where you replace some of those influences so that the new influence can help you see a better picture. There is a voice, there is a sound, there is a sight that is coming from God on the earth today. And when we find ourselves hearing it, we will find ourselves also looking for it so that we will see into the next place, not just being satisfied with where we are. There are some of you that you continue to offer the same products and that's why you have the same group of clients. If you would offer something new, you would grasp, you would pick up someone new. You're looking to expand, but you can't expand if you don't have a vision of what that expansion actually looks like. You have faith to expand. It's all in you. You're all ready. You just have to see something. What is it that we see when we look around? All of us, every single one of us, there are times we sit, you might be single and you sit around in your house and at the present time, you just see you and the couch, and the TV. And if, if that is satisfying to you, if that is your vision, then be content in that and flourish in that. Because there are people who are single that can accomplish a whole lot of stuff because they don't have the weight of family. That's not a, that's not a bad thing, it's a reality thing. But if you are single and you look and you say, I, 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 want, I want a family. Like, I actually want my kids running around spilling milk all over the floor. I want that. that that's something I want. If you have, if there's something, like, can you see it? Do you see that or do you just see an empty couch and it frustrates you? And it, it causes you anxiety because now you worry, is this it? Let me, let me just say, You're at a place you need to see. You need to see what is your future. Don't don't be distracted by the present. You need to see your future. Some of you, your household is a train wreck. It is an absolute train wreck. Um, And that's all you see. I don't mean it's a mess and cushions are everywhere. I just mean everybody's always mad at each other. There's no peace in your household. There's always yelling and doors slamming or everybody just sits in their silos and never like comes out. And you need to see yourselves. Like you need to see all of you gathered around that kitchen table having dinner together. You need to see yourselves all with your heads bowed before that meal. That might be the only prayer that you have as a family. Take advantage of that moment and just pray, not just over the food, but pray blessings upon every single person because until you feed them again, you're not gonna see them again. Let's just take the moments that we have to allow them to build the vision in our hearts. What do you see? Because many times our happiness 
is based on what we see. And if we can't see vision and all we see is the present, then we're going to live in a frustration. And the problem is that frustration is going to contribute to greater levels of chaos. But the vision will contribute to greater levels of peace because as we begin to see it, now our faith has something to walk towards. As we see it and we walk towards it, it begins to manifest around us. What do you see? Peter was in this, in this place where he, um, there was a transition that, that God's preachers were in. And it was time for the gospel to go outside of Jerusalem. It was time for the gospel to be preached to the Gentiles as it had been prophesied hundreds and hundreds of years before that. And so in this moment, God gives Peter a vision. And Peter sees all of these wonderful animals, beautiful animals. But then he hears a command to kill and eat. And he says, oh, no, no, not so, because I don't eat anything unclean. He no longer saw the animals. At the command, all of a sudden, he saw what was forbidden. At first, it was a sheet full of beautiful animals, but at the command to kill and eat, he no longer saw beautiful animals. What he saw was what was forbidden. And then he says it again. This happens three times. And then finally, God says, do not call unclean what I have called clean. We find ourselves sometimes where we can look and we see something that is broken and rather than declaring what we see that it is something that is broken, we need to declare that it is something that is put together again. We do not declare that we have a depleted business. What we declare, this isn't the end, but this is the beginning. We don't declare that there has been loss. Rather, what we declare is that something has been pruned, that some of the dead weight has been cut off. We just have to see things differently. Vision forces our perspective to shift and when it shifts then we see what God is going to work the miracle that he's going to work in our lives rather than seeing the chaos that is at the present everything is under his control everything Everything has been put in subjection to him. So if we can see him, then we can see the vision instead of the present chaos. What are we looking for? In 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 12, it says it like this. For now, we see dimly in a mirror, but then face to face. Now we know in part, but then we will fully know. There's a macro principle there of Jesus, and when we see Jesus, all of the sudden, everything that we didn't know that we know, all of a sudden, the things that we didn't understand, we understand. But there's also a micro principle that would say that we see dimly in the present, but then if we can see Jesus, we can see more fully what we need to be marching towards. It sort of looks like this. When you were younger, you probably took really, really, really long showers. And those really, really long, hot showers, you'd get done and get out, and the mirror was literally fogged, and you could see nothing. You would see dimly. Now, you would get dressed, but in order to brush your hair, you had to do something. And none of us would have dared left that bathroom without actually brushing our hair. But how did you brush your hair if the mirror was all fogged up? We had to do that thing that drove our moms crazy. We just put our hand on the mirror and swipe it. And we would create this huge mess on the mirror, but at least all of a sudden we would be able to see. And sometimes we spend, we go to that secret place and we spend some time in prayer complaining. We spend some time in prayer laying out our need, but we don't stay long enough for the mirror to sort of just calm down so that we can see something. What are you taking the time to see? Are you spending all your time in the chaos or... Are you taking moments so that you can see? Seeing is something that has always been a promise to the children of God, always. It's always been a promise. If we go back through, we took the Old Testament. We talked about some of these prophets, the prophet Ezekiel. It was interesting. 
that there were over 30 times that he said, the word of the Lord came to me, the word of the Lord came to me, the word of the Lord came to me. He heard that word. That word that came brought him faith, but there were at least four times when he said, the vision of God came and I saw. Let me just say, you don't need, you don't need to see near as much as you need to hear. But if all we ever do is hear and we never see, that's not good either. And so I'm just breaking away from the usual conversation just to say this, that we need to take opportunity when we can't see, when we have no vision, when we know we're tired, when we know it's just I fulfilled this thing, but I'm not sure what the next thing is, that we take the time to see. Um, there was a, a prophet named Balaam. And I'm always a little confused on what to, how to describe Balaam. It wasn't that he was a false prophet because what he said actually came to pass. But he was certainly at the very least a confused prophet because he wasn't a good prophet either. And um, one day Balaam was riding on his donkey and he was going to use his gift to do what he should not do. Some of you, you're frustrated in life because things aren't working out for you and they're not working out because you're using a good God-given gift to do something stupid with. And when we use our good God-given gifts, but we use them in the wrong context, all we do is bring frustration to ourselves. So here Balaam is, he's on the road to do something that he should not do and there was an angel of the Lord in front of him. And the angel of the Lord in front of him scared his donkey that he'd been riding on for years, a faithful donkey, scared his donkey so that his donkey stopped. And when this happened, Balaam became very aggravated with his donkey and he beat his donkey and this went on and on. And then finally, this is like one of the most fascinating stories in the Bible, the donkey turns, the donkey turns and basically says to Balaam, I'm saving your life here. I've been a faithful servant to you and you don't see what I see. And all of a sudden, Balaam's eyes were opened and he saw the angel of God standing in front of his pathway. Now, why didn't he go further where he should not go? Because all of the sudden, he saw. Vision will do a multitude of things. Sometimes we will just see the end of the road that we're on, and when we see the end of the road that we're on leading to destruction, we will stop and turn a different way. Why? Because finally I saw that this is leading me nowhere. Some of you, the Spirit of the Lord is opening your eyes to the end of your pathway, and you're seeing and you're understanding that the road that you're on is leading you to destruction. And the only thing for you to do right now is to just turn from your direction Direction and go a different way because what you see is the end. But we also see where there was this moment in the life of Elisha. And Elisha had been warning the armies of God where the king of Syria had been coming against them. So basically it would be like the armies of God would be in a particular city and then the uh, Syrians would go set up in another place to attack the armies of the children of Israel. And instead of going this direction where they were going, Elisha would warn the armies of God and they'd go a different direction. It got so frustrating to the king of Syria that he said, this is like ridiculous. We have a mole. Somebody is telling them what's going on because no one is that good. No one is that strategic. Let me just say in any economy, in any given time, when we find ourselves submitted and following the spirit of the Lord, he will make us look so good that people won't understand what's going on. And so this is what was happening in that moment. They've got it, there has to be a mole. And then one of the guys said, actually, it's not a mole at all. They have this prophet, and this prophet actually hears the strategies that you're developing, King, in your bedroom. And he said, well, then let's go take out the prophet. So now the prophet and his servant, they go to bed, they wake up the next day, and when they wake up, the army of the king of Syria has surrounded the prophet. And the servant sees it, and he is panicked. And he says, I, 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 don't, I don't know what to do. Like, they're everywhere. Can you, like, this, we've got to do something. And very calmly, the prophet just prays. And he says, God, open his eyes. 
and let him see that those that are for us are far greater than those who are against us. And just with the change of vision, all of a sudden, the servants saw the armies of God surrounding the armies of the Syrians. And there was a peace, there was a quiet that came to him because of what he saw. How did he get there? Because somebody prayed. How are you going to get there when you take your place? There was a prophet named Habakkuk. They were called seers in the Old Testament. S-E-E-R, seer. And in Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 1, it said, this is the oracle from God that the prophet Habakkuk saw. And it outlined this vision that the prophet had seen. And then after this vision, it said that the prophet made a complaint to God. That was a time of prayer that he just got into the presence of God and he said, God, here's what's going on and this, is, this isn't how things should be. He just described the present time. He prayed about the present time. It didn't look like God was in control. It didn't look like everything was in subjection to him. And so he complained about the moment. But then I love how chapter two and verse one starts. Habakkuk says, I will take my stand at my watch post, and I will station myself. Listen, let's let all those eyes in myself. I will take my stand at my watch post, and I will station myself on the tower, and I will look out to see. And it said in that moment, God said, write the vision down. Make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. When you take the time to stand and station yourself, when you take the time to look out and see, when God gives you vision, as you begin to write and journal and draw pictures, and it's just not exactly, and no, 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 I'm gonna edit, that's not, that's not what I see, that's not what I, that's not what I understand, and you just begin to fashion this vision that God is giving you for your future, this vision that God is giving you for your family, this vision that he's giving you for your career. As you begin to see this, you've gotta write it down, you've gotta make it plain, because you have to run. You have to be able to run. You can't run if you can't see it. You can't run if you don't understand where you're going. You need to be able to see. And when you see it, your faith will carry you to it. But we have to see it first. Um, last night, I'm going to end with this. And this is sort of a weird way to end a sermon. Um, but you know what? We're on TV. Like, there are no rules anymore, right? We'll just, we'll just do this as it comes out. Um, it, like, this is a really big church. And this is going to be a really transparent conversation. So just bear with me. But it's a, like, it's a really, really big church. And as a result, there are a whole lot of victories and you hear about people having babies and people getting married and people starting businesses and like people having birthdays. Happy birthday, Brooklyn, by the way. 16 years old, take care of that Jeep, be good. Um, you hear about all this, like, all this awesome good stuff. But then you also hear about the not so awesome stuff. And um, it gets a little bit weighty sometimes. Because there are people's lives that you, you see the devastation. You see the loss. You hear who's in the hospital. You hear who passed away. And, and you, it, it can just get to be a little much. And um, last night I just began to, like I have to see stuff. I have to touch things. And I just, if hopefully this helps you. If not, throw it away and just... The first part of the sermon, I hope, helps. But I just began to walk around this room. 
I'd already prayed for every chair. I pray for every chair in this room every single week, whether you're here sitting in it or whether you're not. Because what I did yesterday, I just pray that God, every chair that represents somebody that's watching online in our family, that in the name of Jesus, you resurrect their faith and you give them vision. And I pray it over every single chair because I pray it over you. All that chair is, is you. But when I was done, I wasn't satisfied. And I was frustrated because of just some of the bad news. And I just began to walk around this room. And some of you, what you have seen is bad news. What you are seeing is chaos. At the present time, it is not, it is not God's working in your life that you're seeing. It's just a mess. And so I just began to walk around this room. And I just began to pray in the Spirit as I walked around this room. And then I just began to see things as I walked around this room. And I pointed to sections and I prayed over your neighborhood and I prayed over sections and I prayed over your household. And then I got over here and I prayed for a man that I know. And you know what? You've been drinking too much during this quarantine because you're in fear. You're in fear that everything, you're going to lose it all. You're in fear that it's going to be taken away. But in the name of Jesus, fear not in the name of Jesus may peace come into your life may it come into your household and I just began to pray and I began to pray and I began to pray not just for you but for that one that's in the hospital that in the name of Jesus it doesn't look so good but in the name of Jesus because of his power you will stand up you will walk you will do everything that you've always been able to do because greater is he who is for you than the one that's against you. And the more I prayed for you, all of you, the more I saw the victory, the, the more I saw your open sign on the business instead of the closed sign. It's not going to be taken away. God is going to work a work in our day that if he told us yesterday, we wouldn't even believe it. But we know that all things, that everything, that it works together for good to those who are called according to the purposes of God. And so we just have to stand our watch so that we can see past the present into the vision that God would give us. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Your children will not fail. Your marriage will not. It will not. In the name of Jesus, your family will not fall apart. We just walk around the room. Some of you need to, when everybody goes to bed, you just need to walk through your household and stretch your hand into those bedrooms and say they have the mind of Jesus. They have the mind of Jesus. They have the peace of God. No fear, no fear, no weapon formed against them prospers. And you just pray, you take your stand at your watch post. You station yourself at the tower and you look out to see. And as you see it, you declare it. As you see it, you begin to speak it. As you see it, you begin to pray it so that now all of a sudden I'm prophesying what I see. It's not just vision to see so I can have a few goosebumps, but I begin to speak that which I see so that there is life where there's been death, so that there is fullness where there's been insufficiency, so that there is peace where there's been anxiety. What do you see? In the name of Jesus, may you see what God desires you to see so that it will be as God declares it to be. Glory, glory in a thousand hallelujahs. Oh Lord my God, how great you are.